Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu, and I am so thrilled to have Peter Falland from Berlin, Germany with me today. Now, you may be wondering, who is Peter Falland? Peter Falland is a photographer, he's a writer, and most notably, he's the author of the latest Rocky Milk book called Mastering the Fujifilm X100T and X100S cameras. Now, the reason I have him on is because I bought an X100T several months ago and I received the box, I was excited, I opened it up, and lo and behold, really there was no manual. It was sort of like a go for it kind of deal with from Fuji. So I said, there's gotta be somebody who's writing a book about this. And indeed, I went looking at the Rocky Nook website and I found Peter's name and I said, I wanted to talk to Peter about this book. Uh, Peter, welcome to the show, man. Sir, so thank you so much for having me on your show. And I feel really thrilled that you love the Fuji X100 as much as I do. Because for me, this little beast is really a great camera. And uh, it really changed my way of working quite a lot. Because it's really more getting back to something like this. If you look at this Ooh, little yeah. beauty here. This is like the a... camera I started shooting on and I loading film and then really focusing on the on the subject and not playing with menus and titles and settings and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is really what brought me into photography something like a hundred years ago. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, indeed. Uh, I, I know you've, you've got a, a, a breadth of experience as a photographer um, and you've traveled the world and uh, you've really played with a bunch of photography equipment recently and including one where you've converted, converted a, a view camera where the DS where, where the where you've actually uh, attached a DSLR to the end of a, a view camera to make it the sensor is that true that is true actually yeah you are talking about my old buddy this uh, a Sina F1 ah, a huge Sina. monster this is really uh, yeah you, you you carry a 20 kilo box with one camera inside and and of course, I mean, in principle, this would have been uh, used shooting a 4 by 5 inch film at a time. But nowadays, I mean, I used it quite often for an architectural documentation project back in Switzerland. And then the idea was, uh, man, you with this film, it doesn't work. It takes too long to get everything done and scanned. So why not just adapting a normal DSLR to the back of the camera? And here we go. Because then you are just kind of scanning uh, through the full frame of this 4 by 5 inch thing in something like, I don't remember, 15 or 20 single uh, frames. And then in Photoshop, you put it together and you have one monster uh, picture and uh, that's it. Eh? Yeah, so I, I like doing the MacGyver thing with cameras quite a lot, you know. <laughs> I, I, just, didn't, uh, I didn't realize you had MacGyver out, out in Germany as well. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> this is my childhood. I mean, this is was it? the thing where I said, uh, Mommy, Daddy, no time for dinner. Peter is watching MacGyver. I mean, this was a must. <laughs> oh, is that right? Wow. This was a must. Was it in English or was it in German, though? It was in German at the time, but the cool thing is about YouTube and so on. As you just uh, not so long ago, I really checked on some old episodes in ah, English. I see. And of course, the original uh, dubbing is much better than the German synchron voice of Mr. MacGyver himself. <laughs> and, uh, that's funny, yeah. Um, so c can I then call you the MacGyver of mirrorless cameras? Is that, is that, would that be uh, a fair thing to call you? Uh, I'm not sure because actually the great thing is about those little mirrorless cameras. You don't have to do any playing around and any construction work anymore. You just take it as it is. And yeah, because I always say in my classes, in my photography workshops, I mean, guys, focus on the five main things in the photography, which is you set your aperture, you set your shutter speed, you choose your ISO, you choose the, the distance to your subject. And yeah, and I mean here there's no zoom. This is another thing I love about the little X100. It's a 35 millimeter uh, uh, equivalent lens, so it's 23 millimeter. So in, in a full on a full format camera, on a film camera like the Leica, it would be 35 millimeter, sure. and you shoot. This means quite often I even use some duct tape or something like Rizzoli to seal off the display mm -hmm. because uh, we don't want to watch video games here. We want to take pictures and we check them later. <laughs> right. So I put a small memory card in it that, that you really to capture only a few raw files and then you just shoot and you really concentrate on taking the picture. You, you communicate with your subject or you, you really compose your frame mm -hmm. and you take the picture and you are not playing with submenus and try to find where to set your ISO setting in the fifth submenu somewhere where you're playing with the buttons. Yeah, this is really, I would say, a good summary why I really love this little camera 
And on, I told you already before, I'm not only using the X100. I, of course, I also use the X-T1 with a bunch of lenses, That's right. which, uh, which are great because of the optical quality. But um, really, if I would have to choose one single camera that I would take to, let's say, to an island, so to speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be for sure that one because it, you really travel light. You have no more gear. Right. Yeah, maybe that's a good point talking about that for a second. I mean, the beginning uh, for me from changing from a big and heavy DSLR system to the mirrorless cameras really started like this. Eh? That, yeah, here we go. I mean, this is 1.2 kilos or something. And yes, here we go. Eh? You know, I, and then I, I don't miss my DSLR when I'm walking around with my X100T. I don't miss my DSLR at all. You That's know. the point. Uh, let me get one thing straight. If people tell me what is the perfect camera, the one camera that then can do everything and everything, I, I tell you, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. The, the one and only camera that does everything doesn't exist. So, of course, in the past, DSLR, full-frame DSLR was the way to go. Uh, but then really now it's two years that I'm really uh, using uh, professionally and privately the, the Fuji X system just because I love the quality of the lenses. I love the, let's say, manual touch and feel to the camera itself that you really uh, operate the camera and you are not uh, playing a Wi-Fi uh, game station or something like this. Huh? Uh, Xbox it's called, sorry. I'm not a gamer. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, it's not an Xbox that you really play with the software. You really take pictures. Right, right. And uh, and yeah, and this is how I then, uh, something like two years ago, a good friend of mine borrowed me an X-Pro1 at the time. And I thought, okay, for, for going on vacation or something like this, looks like a cool camera to me. I like this retro vintage style. But then I started shooting. And I said, whoa, that is much more than just a cool looking camera. This is a real camera you can really work with. And then, of course, in the beginning, uh, you are shy. You say, okay, it does to have a DSLR. The autofocus might be too slow. Uh, the client will be not happy if I show up with a small camera and so on and so on. But very quickly, I found out this is all not true because in the end, the image that you take counts. And in the end, nobody's asking you about the camera that you used. Absolutely. Or at least yeah. I, would, I would not jump on that train and start discussing that. I mean, that's my personal choice. I use the camera I feel comfortable with. And if you like the pictures that I'm taking or that we did the agreed on, that you, then, then everything is cool. Mm -hmm. That's so right. From that point of view, yeah, from that point of view, for me, a camera is really a tool. And then if in addition, it's a nice one that you love working with, it's even better because then you really focus mainly on communicating with your subject or really right. uh, you're thinking more about framing the image and not so much playing with the, with the technology behind it. And this is really, yeah, in a nutshell, what it, I like about it. It, it, it. From what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like Fuji has figured out how to simplify the process of making photographs and and is almost returning us back to the the age of just making art again you know it's all about the moment again for me when i when i lift the x100t to my eye and it's it has i I've, i don't have to mess around really with all the settings i know there's lots of sub menus and things like that you could work with but i don't i don't even mess with that i just try and just make it nice and simple and just be present and photograph the moment. Is that how you feel as well? Uh, absolutely. Because, I mean, as you said, in the past it was like this, you loaded your favorite film uh, depending on what you were going to shoot and mm -hmm. then you were just really taking the picture. That's it. Right. And here it's pretty similar because I love the quick menu. So th those few settings that nowadays in the digital age you have to adjust and you have to put in your camera in the right way you need it. Mm -hmm. This I do via the quick menu. Some, let's say, few deeper menu settings you, you pre-figure uh, before mm -hmm. and then you're ready to go. Yeah. And, um, and the point is also... Yeah, yeah go sorry. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I, and that's the point, really, that you are, I'm really also kind of not doing any post-production anymore in terms of shooting everything raw and then having this feeling I have to run through a raw converter before there's a proper image coming out. In, in, along that line, I really love those film simulations that they put in because up to now, for me, some kind of color grading settings in a camera this was also something like where i said whoa a big uh, company of, of for cameras uh, starting with a c or an n uh, to quote two examples are just over uh, uh, saturating any color and then they call it vivid or cool or super or whatsoever and i said this i don't like if i need really super strong saturated colors i do that in photoshop later this, right. this was in the past right, right but today you say you said uh, something like a fuji astia or a velvia or now this cr classic chrome which mm -hmm. i really love it's really a cool look it's beautiful then uh, you, you switch it in you dial it in and then you said that's my film i'm shooting with today and, and that's it huh? 
and the quality of the JPEG files coming out of this X-Trans sensor is really fantastic. So, um, yeah, it's very rarely now that I really shoot RAW because I say, why do I go through all the hassle of doing the, the, the post-production and uh, the post-processing uh, to get a workable TIFF file out of it or whatever if the JPEG file is really great? Indeed. And Indeed. I mean, uh, that's the case. I mean, this is, it, it, I think it all happens up here. If you think, oh, I'm a pro, I'm, I'm shooting the best quality, so it has to be RAW. Um, for sure, if I'm not sure about lighting situations or you work really in, in, a, in an environment where you say, whoa, this 14F stops here in light from dark to, to bright, uh, I'm not 100% sure this very second how to properly expose, then you, you switch to RAW. Indeed. But come on, honestly speaking, I mean, if we would have a portrait shooting right now, um, I'm in my room here, we have the lights set up, so once the exposure is determined, we are not changing that anymore. Then we are communicating through the viewfinder uh, viewfinder, that's a great uh, keyword here. I love, of course, the optical viewfinder of the camera that you yeah. really, really see with your pure uh, human eye. You see what you're shooting. And yeah. Tell, and me, it gets tell me a little bit about the yeah. book. I know, we, uh, you know, I'm curious as to why you decided uh, to write this book. Um, it, and why, why were you the person to, to write this book? Uh, that's a funny story because actually somehow uh, the book decided to be written by me, if you want to put it by the, like this. Uh, it was on the last photo keener when the editor in chief of the of the publishing house uh, approached me while I was working at Fotokina, actually for Fuji at that time. We were uh, demonstrating new camera stuff. We had, in, we had shootings on the on stage, and uh, yeah, and then he came and said, "Whoa, I, I know your work. I know that you are working with those cameras." And then we were discussing why I'm using those cameras. This is exactly what we were just talking about now. Sure. And uh, then. Um, uh, I was familiar with uh, other books that were published about the, the X100, the X100S, and That's then right. all the uh, interchangeable lens cameras. And I really like the style those books are written um, because, as you said, it's not just a manual repeating you. There are 10 buttons. They do this and this and this. For me, a book like this should really try to give the reader a little bit of a possibility to see how one specific photographer is working with this camera. Because there's no universal right or wrong. I mean, there are always several ways how you can do something. Yeah, and I said, I mean, I, I love teaching. Or I really love working with my students here in Berlin. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, and I'd already there, I, I started putting something down, what I called my 30 pages of what you should remember after my workshop, you know. It's a small PDF file. And then so some essentials about how to operate the camera, uh, how to set the exposure properly and, and all those kind of things are put in a small PDF. And I said, wow, why not extending that a little bit and then really focusing on the 100S, 100T? And yeah, and this is how it all got together. I mean, and if you go through the book, you will find out, I mean, I am as technical as needed. Because, I mean, somebody who knows everything about the camera may be uh, interested in, in more looking like on pictures than reading a book like this. But I, I somehow try to find a balance between uh, really showing working examples, how I'm using the camera, what kind of things I'm shooting with it. And then just focusing on the important technical innovations and features the camera offers. Huh? Right. Because here it, it's really different uh, to, let's say, a standard DSLR. And this I try to, to figure out and to point out really in the book to make it clear. Indeed. Uh, would you say this is the missing manual for Fuji X100T? Honestly speaking, this is a difficult question to answer. I think if Fujifilm themselves would have asked me, Peter, why don't you write a cool manual f written by a photographer for photographers, something like this, then it would have been probably written a little bit different because then a manual also must, uh, let's say, answer all the questions of somebody who never was shooting with a camera like this before, who maybe is really more than interested in answering basic questions about really to operate each single button of the camera. Or, for, for example, to go through all the points in the menu to explain everything in detail. Why can you jump from uh, color space, Adobe RGB to sRGB and so on. I mean, those things are really skipped on purpose because I, I really try to focus on the points that I would say are important for me as a photographer using the camera as the tool, as the extension of my eyes, if you want to see it like this. And, and yeah, this was this balancing act of um, not being too sloppy and not skipping important parts, but not going too much step by step through all 27,000 uh, topics in, 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 in the menus. I mean, this I didn't want to do, I don't know, as we said. Indeed. Because then it's a kind of standard manual, and this we wanted to avoid. Um. Absolutely. Because as you say in the book, there's, and you offer this as well, 
there's a link to a 300 page version of the manual on the Fuji website. Yep. Now I, I had, I know, as I said in the, my introduction to the, to our chat, uh, the first time I opened my X 100 T box, uh, the manuals was very disappointing. I mean, I couldn't even believe that they even included something as small and short as that. And it seemed more like a get started kind of guide more than anything else. And, uh, I was wondering where what happened. You know, why did Fuji leave us hanging like that? And I'm so glad I'm so glad you were able to give me the link to the 300 page manual. Yeah. If I if I want to go out to figure out uh, in my new detail how to use a, a certain setting, now I know where to go. Um, yeah, a couple of questions but, for but, you. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Uh, Zesha, I think it's funny that you mentioned it, but I think this is not something that you find with all kind of cameras. In, in the past, you were unboxing your camera, then there came a rather thick or, or thicker even manual yes. out of it, and you could read in 27 languages uh, yes, yes. every little, little thing about the camera. I mean, nowadays it's on a CD-ROM inside usually, or nowadays even they skip the CD-ROM and say, you, anyway, guys, you will download it from the website. Right. And I think for those few people that are shooting with a camera like this and are not having an uh, internet connection whatsoever, they put, uh, I would call it kind of starting guidelines or something like this sure. in this little booklet. Right. But then, I mean, I agree with you. Um, the link to the main full manual should be more dominant or should be more pr stressed, pronounced, printed in red or whatsoever. Absolutely. Be because... Um, yeah, some people just sometimes want to say, okay, here I know where to find this kind of information and you know where it is. Indeed. This was also a little bit about the idea to not only write the book, but also kind of maintain a little website uh, in parallel. Because uh, you can imagine just while writing the book, things changed. In, for example, in terms of a firmware update, mm -hmm. maybe we should talk about the firmware updates a little later because in, with those cameras, they are really, really important. And I can't stress enough that you guys should really keep checking if there's a new firmware update coming out and then really uh, in, um, upgrade your camera because very, very often this is really giving you a kind of new model for free. Yes, indeed. And Fuji is very good, very, very good at really uh, not just doing bug fixes like what the firmware update was uh, supposed to be doing in the past. It's mm -hmm. really adding new functionality. I mean, one of the things that I've always, uh, I, I wish things would be better, uh, is an extended battery life. Do you agree? Yes, I have to say, if you look at all Fuji range, the, the X100 series is still a good one. I mean, I love the XT1 for all what it can do, but this thing is just eating batteries like an old Cadillac is drinking uh, gallons of gas. And you just, <laughs> you, you have a battery grip under the camera. You have two batteries inside, right. and I take always four charged spare batteries. Yeah. So I'm never leaving the house without six batteries. Right. Because, I mean, it's really, really stupid if you are just in the moment of the coolest uh, shooting and then you're running out of electricity. Eh? Yeah. With the X100, it's much better. I think that one spare battery for sure brings me through the day. I mean, this is what I can say. I have three, actually, that I carry with me all the time. Uh, okay. But it's always, I always wondered, why is it that, I, I know why the draining happens, the drain of the, the, the battery, but it is it possible that a firmware update could take care of the uh, the conservation of the of the energy in some way. I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, I would say, according to my experience, I, can, I would give uh, you guys the following advice: uh, stop checking every single picture you took on the display. Put to brightness setting plus five because it's a sunny, nice day, and then you look at the picture. Say, oh, I captured a great image. Then I would say, come on. I mean, this you see when you look through the viewfinder. And if you use the optical viewfinder, uh, the energy consumption, I would say, is quite minimal. <laughs> right. And then if the picture was not good, it's anyway captured already. Then Indeed. you can see that also later. Indeed. I mean, the point, of course, during a shooting in between, you check if everything is fine. But then once I'm convinced that my exposure settings are fine and that um, the camera is set up properly, then I really concentrate on shooting. Because, I mean, I do a lot of uh, portrait photography and there, it, I can promise you, it would really, really embarrass or disturb uh, the model or the person you are taking pictures of. doesn't have to be a professional model, of course. Mm. If you spend 90% of the time staring at your camera, so now let's have we have a shooting. Let's well, Now I'm starting. So now, ah, hi, Sasha, now we are taking a picture. Zack, I took the picture and I do this. And now I stare at my screen all the time. And you think, what is he doing? He doesn't even know what he's doing. Is he even a real photographer? I'm kidding. Eh? <laughs> so then I, I only focus on my screen and you think what is going on. 
And the point is with this little camera, I'm shooting, I see you all the time. I, have, I see you with one eye, I see you with the other eye, I see you now through the viewfinder. And I think this is one thing uh, where you can save a lot of battery life if you really keep shooting. And I mean, for me, there would be even a setting like totally switching the display off. I mean, now I usually just set Th it. That uh, is to possible to do, right? That is possible. Yes, to do. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, exactly. I, I only always shoot actually having only the electronic or the optical viewfinder on the display is off. Gotcha. And that's it. Okay. Uh, you talk about uh, the use of different adapters. I know the. Fuji has come out with the, the wide angle adapter and the, the more of a, a 56 millimeter uh, adapt wide angle of, I guess it would be a, a telephoto. Yeah, adapter. the wide angle one, the wide angle one would be 28. 28 so the classic okay. 20, 28 millimeter for the wide okay. angle and there's the portrait adapter or tele adapter as they call it, which right. would be the equivalent of 50 millimeters. I have to because ask Because like you, this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, no, like, like this, you have the classic three uh, lenses. You have 28, 35, 50 millimeters. So this means if you really jump back to the good old Leica, I mean, this is a 3F with a fixed lens. But if you take any Leica M shooter at the time when I was a child or something like this, my grandpa, my dad, they would have in the best case a Leica M and then those three lenses. Mm -hmm. the, the 50 millimeter, the little bit wider normal lens like 35 and then the, at that time really wide angle lens, which would be the 28. Uh, and that's it. Huh? A friend of mine whose name is Eric Francis runs a, a Facebook forum uh, called Fujinistas. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, place for people like you, perhaps even, to come in and, and give us advice on how to use our cameras better. Um, what are the things that, uh, that I uh, am always hearing from him is it, would, it wouldn't it be awesome, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be an amazing thing for... Fuji to have an X camera, an X100 camera that is a fixed 56 millimeter versus what it is right now, which is a fixed 23, right? So okay, a 56 is yeah, that's quite a jump. I mean, the, the 56 1.2 on the XT1 is a great portrait lens. Yes, would you, would you uh, see an X100 with a, a with a longer lens, perhaps? Wow. Actually, I mean, I was more thinking along the line that you would really have a real 50 millimeter X100. This is something I would see in the near future. I mean, uh, I don't have any details, of course, but this is if you really listen to all the rumors that are spreading and if you talk to the community and also to Fuji people, I would say a 56 is probably a long shot because, I mean, there would be for sure a few people who would like it. But what you have to always consider, I mean, such a camera is built for mass market. I mean, you're not creating a camera that would make 20 people happy. That's right. Okay, if those 20 people pay $500,000 <laughs> a camera, then it works maybe. But, I mean, a 56 it's make uh, financial fixed sense. focal length, X100, and wow, uh, it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. But also, honestly speaking, I'm not sure if then I would not rather take the X-T1 really with the 56 millimeter lens because for me, the, the, as, a really, as the portrait lens, as really having a real portrait session or something like this, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to talk about it. I mean, why not? Yeah. But then you could come up, you could take, start a survey about all the Fuji shooters on the planet, what kind of lenses they like. And then maybe they are the 10 most liked lenses and then you would need 10 versions of the X100 with all those lenses. <laughs> and I think this is not going to happen. Uh, I think the 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, those two maybe are... Uh, that's probably the range of cameras that where you would see the X100 Indeed. family. Um, what challenges were you presented with when you were writing your book? Uh, yeah, the challenge is actually, um, yeah, that's interesting. Let's say first, I would say you really have to figure out what you put in in more detail, what you really skip. Because as we just talked about 10 minutes ago, I mean, I, it was not the idea to, let's say, let, let's write the manual again in my own words. I mean, this nobody wants to read. Right. Uh, the, the, the challenge was really to think uh, out of the box, to, let's say, to see myself being a reader, let's say maybe with an advanced beginner's level or something like this, where this kind of reader or photographer would need some more advice on really how to operate the camera, technically speaking. And then really uh, trying to get as creative as possible in the, in the last chapter, uh, second to last chapter, where I was really talking about, let's say, day, uh, everyday life shooting situations. So well, what kind of shooting I would take the X100 with me if you would also say you have the other one at home. So that was probably the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. 
Then another challenge was, of course, to really get all the details right. Because sometimes you are quickly writing something, it sounds okay to you, and then you just uh, swap a parameter, or you say in menu 3.2 or something like this, and then, whoa, then later you find out, oh my gosh, it's not 3.2, it's 2.3. <laughs> right. Of course, yeah. if you already used the camera for, for a few months, you are not confused by that because you would say, ah, okay, it's here. Right, right. But if somebody really holding the camera in, in, in your hands for the first time, and then you really go through step by step, and you say, whoa, it's just not wrong I have the wrong camera right. and of course you have to be precise and yeah and that that was another challenge eh? you've worked with the X100 uh, S uh, even the X100 I imagine and now the X100T and you've seen it improve steadily thanks to not just the internal internal uh, guts like the you know having the hybrid uh, viewfinder sensor. or, or, the, or yes. the new sensor or whatever it is uh, but what kinds of things do you feel Fuji could be improving on the camera? What could it do better, in your opinion, based on your experience? Yes. For example, I mean, just talking, I mean, I, first of all, I have to say that X100, uh, I was using a few times. I did, never had one myself. Okay. So at that time, uh, I, I was still one of the guys carrying around a big, heavy DSLR. So I just saw the X100 and I thought, wow, that could be cool one day, but that was too early for me. Then really starting to work with was the X100S. And there, for example, one thing uh, just from the uh, practicality in, in sh operating the camera, it, it had here, and instead of these four, um, and I have to see not to really now, that should be okay, it had a, it had a dial here. Right. that you could also press and that was quite fiddly so I was really never really happy with those dial okay. and here you see of course here just now the four function buttons that work very well mm. it's exactly the same D-pad that you now have in the X-T1 so this is something um, that uh, Fuji is really listening to all the people out there uh, working with those cameras and really ask what you guys would like to have improved mm -hmm. talking about the exposure compensation dial for example if you go right here we were now we go from uh, minus three to plus three People are shooting landscape with those cameras, creating uh, HDRs. They do a manual exposure bracketing, shooting zero plus one plus two plus three. Tuck, here we go. Tuck, tuck, tuck. So these are really things where only a few details were uh, adapted or changed in, in the, um, let's say, in the layout of the buttons. Mm -hmm. But to me, it makes sense. More, and here, I would say now all the things are where they should be. Um, so here, if you would ask me now about the next X100, just right now, I would not really say uh, this button or that thing I would totally change. I mean, this is, it depends also on the size of hands, for example. I mean, for me, it's just a good size. Right. I know quite a few photo photographers that say, yeah, here on the back side, if I'm pressing something, I always press three buttons at a time. Right. I use a thumb rest. Okay. I use a thumb yes. rest, so, which, which always helps a great deal. So. Absolutely, this already helps. This is quite nice. But also, I have to admit, for me here with the camera, I'm quite okay with it without. Mm. I, I played with it. I um, mean, uh, recently I was using it quite often also with studio uh, lights or uh, with a studio strobe system. And then you had had the trigger on here, and so this is why I removed the thumb breast. Okay. But no, it's it's fine. Also, the, the weight is good. It handles nicely. I mean, I would stress that the grip here is important. I, I would not uh, use the camera or would not like to use it so much without the additional grip. Because here, you now you really grab it nicely and you really can uh, yes. nicely hold it. Absolutely. And for me, what is really genius, if you see here, if you change the, the aperture ring, uh, I think this angle is fine. This way that you have those two extra, let's say, st uh, structural elements where you really grab it and then you turn. This is so much nicer than just a ring. This is something really smart. Uh, also, honestly speaking, I don't know any other camera that really has it like this. Maybe uh, they are, but this is a small detail that I really love. Indeed. So I, I would say, from the mechanical point of view, it's very well done. Indeed. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I know we've tried to schedule this uh, multiple times, uh, uh, and I'm happy this book is coming out uh, for Fuji photographers everywhere in the world. It's going to be uh, uh, one of those books that you you'd want to buy. Uh, uh, read through at least a couple of times and familiarize yourself with your your camera. Um, I know I bought the the download from Rocky Nook, and I'll have a link for that in this blog post as well. Is there anything else you'd like to add to my uh, for for my audience? Yes, uh, first. 
Yes, yeah, so first of all, I would really thank you a lot for, for really, uh, yeah, being so interested in the camera system and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about it. And to, to all the listeners here um, and all the readers, um, I would really recommend uh, checking on the website, get involved via the community because there are so many people that really just now uh, really uh, exchange all the information. This is something I love doing all the time. I say, why keep something for yourself if you can spread the word and, and, uh, and help? Yes. And yeah, because the, the the camera will be evolving, there will be for sure someday will be a firmware update coming, and also this, those links are all is quoted in the book, and are also all put uh, and on a regular basis. I'm updating the website that you can really check what what's uh, what that you're up to speed that you have the latest version, and yeah. Also, um, I'm very happy always to get comments or critics or something because nobody's perfect, and there are always way to make things better. And really, writing this book was so thrilling that I can already tell you there is probably something in the pipeline, to put it like this. Uh, so it, 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 I think it was not the last one. Good. And, and yeah, and of course, uh, to, to make something like this uh, even better, it's always good to, to interact with all my fellow photographers on the planet. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you'll hear from me for sure after I post this on my blog. So thank you so much for joining me today, Peter. Take care. Thank you. And uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Huh? Bye-bye.